What's up guys? Ethan here from Specifically Pacific Diving. I've got a couple tips for you today about how to improve the sustainability factor of your spearfishing bait. fishing game um, to the eating fish or seafood in general game to be fully honest I kind of grew up just not really expecting to like it and just kind of thought that if one less person was eating seafood it was probably for the best but the more and more I learned uh, spear fishing is by far when practiced correctly the most sustainable way of harvesting fish from the ocean and I found it to be more rewarding going out and being able to select the fish that you want, you know, get what you need, bring it in, eat it. It's, I find it much more sustainable than going out and getting a burger and not knowing where that came from. I just believe that the older I got, the more connected I'd want, I wanted to be with my food. However, I may be new to the spear fishing game, but I'm definitely not new to the ocean. Um, I've spent the better part of the last decade studying the ocean, being in, on, or around it. Um, I've worked as a biologist for Humboldt State University, scientific diver, um, and really getting into the impacts that humans have on the ocean. That being said, here are four ways from a biologist standpoint that I believe that every spear fisherman can do to improve the sustainability factor of their spear fishing. Number one, it might sound kind of odd, some of it also makes a lot of sense, but it would be don't take the smallest fish, but also don't take the largest fish. I know everybody wants to go out and get their giant trophy fish and that's fun and all, but the larger the fish, the more it contributes to the next generation when it reproduces. Many of these side limits are based on reproductive maturity. However, something like the vermilion rockfish, which is a commonly taken uh, recreational fish up here in Northern California, um, they don't mature until they're about five years old, about 38 centimeters long. That's a pretty big fish. So if you've taken anything that is smaller than that, it might not have had a chance to reproduce yet. So avoiding those smaller fish while also avoiding those giants, um, not only will help those smaller sized fish give it, be given a chance to reproduce, but it also will ensure that the next generation is gonna be happy and healthy for you the next time. Plus, those big fish sometimes have a lot of worms. So, number two is going to be avoid boffs. Um, boff stands for big, old, fat, fecund females. So this kind of goes back into that first one, um, but this one is uh, about the female specifically. However, a lot of bony fish are not sexually dimorphic. Um, sexually dimorphic means that you can physically, by looking at the fish, tell if it's a male or a female. Um, so that could make it a little bit more difficult to tell if you're taking a male or a female. In California, however, there are a few recreationally taken species um, that are sexually dimorphic. Uh, for example, the California sheephead, um, it is very easy to tell the male from the female here in Northern California, the kelp greenling, um, you can very easily tell a male versus a female. By avoiding these females altogether, um, you eliminate the chance of spearing a fish that perhaps is full of eggs. For those fish that you can't tell if it's a male or a female, this kind of goes back to that first one, by avoiding those really, really big fish, um, especially ones that look like they have a really big belly, if, you know, that could, that could be a female. So avoiding that fish altogether can eliminate that risk. 
what they're finding with these really, really large fish, um, they're finding that the amount of eggs that these females are carrying is quite disproportionate to their body size and their body volume. Um, so you might think that taking two one kilogram fish might have the same impact as taking um, one two kilogram fish, but they're finding that this is just not the case. Um, the difference in uh, a little bit of body volume or a couple centimeters in the fish could mean the difference between thousands or hundreds of thousands or even millions of eggs. So that leads me to number three, which would be really know your sizes. That means know the size of specific fish that you're out here trying to get, but also knowing how to measure them underwater with just your eye. Like I said earlier, um, fish like rockfish don't have a minimum size limit, but things like cabazon, uh, greenling, lingcod, these all have size limits that are set by government entities. So it's really important to know how to size these fish before you pull the trigger. Um, it's not like rod and reel fishing, you know, where if you catch a fish in the shallows and you pull it up, and it doesn't have barotrauma, you can release it, might survive, but usually when you're spearfishing, you've just kind of blasted a hole in the thing, um, so there is not a chance to really release it once you've taken your shot. But what happens if you accidentally take an undersized ling? Um, I would recommend not just leaving it out in the ocean because you don't want to get in trouble. That's, that's kind of lame. Um, I'd bring it in, do what you were gonna do with it, if there happens to be a warden there and you be, and you get cited for it, that's, that's kind of your penance. Trying to avoid that whole situation in the first place um, boils down to just making sure you know how to size these fish underwater. Um, it can be difficult, it can be tricky. A lot of these fish, uh, everything underwater is about 25% larger. So really kind of focusing on overestimating when, before you pull the trigger, um, making the hatch marks on your gun that are you know the sizes of your local fish species um, just will help you in the long run and save you a lot of trouble. And that brings me to number four. Number four is don't take your limit of fish every time you go out spearfishing. Sometimes I see people go out and shoot their limits of a certain complex of fish that has a has a limit of 10 and I see them multiple times a week but here in Northern California there aren't a lot of local spots where I'm at to go spearfishing so these, these guys that go out and take these limits of fish multiple times a week off these few spots that we have there aren't going to be fish there for very much longer a good thing to do is make a plan um, before you even hit the water um, what, are you, what are you trying to go out for? Do you have a target species? Um, are you getting food for just that night? Are you just getting dinner? Are you getting dinner for a few nights? Um, I know sometimes people go out and collect fish for their neighbors and whatnot. Um, but making sure you have a plan can just help you when you go, before you hit the water. Here in California, the possession limit is often the same as the bag limit. So for that one complex I was talking about, um, you can have 10 of those fish. Um, that means with you currently, also that means in your freezer. So if you have 10 rockfish in your freezer, you can't go get 10 more until they're gone. Limiting yourself to just what you need, only take what you need, is probably one of the most important aspects of yeah, trying to avoid having a freezer full of fish. Um, yeah, going out, making a plan, getting some dinner, it's all good. So those are four things that I believe that if you are a spear fisherman and you practice, it will really help increase the sustainability factor of your spear fishing, which is already pretty damn sustainable if you are practicing it correctly. So let me know what you guys think. Um, do you believe that these are true? Do you think that there are more things that you can do as a spear fisherman to help with the sustainable aspect of it? Um, let me know. All right, here's some drone footage because it's a freaking beautiful day up here in Northern California.
Oh, 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 oh,